our topic today is love or bitterness. I've been at the Christian life a pretty good while, close to 40 years now, and I've, as a teacher, as a thinker, and I've come to realize that, you know, you try to boil things down into the simplicity of choice. You know, you want to boil your life down in the complex situations in life down to some basic choices that I can make, you can make, to make my life align with God's, God's plan. And I've learned that all challenges, challenges specifically, as compared to the other, I mean, these are events. You know, they offer us a choice of two things. It's a basic choice of two ways of going. The first uh, as we communicate with ourselves, and, and listen, I want to share this with you so you can understand. I'll be saying these things more and more, but the way that we think is by what we see in our mind, the pictures that we make, and the words that we use as we, as we discuss with ourselves. We have a running conversation with ourselves. I don't know if you realize that. It's called inner dialogue. And that inner dialogue is really the content of your thinking. So when an event occurs, an adverse event occurs, you know, for example, recently Rhonda was in a, a car accident and a fella hit her almost head on and I got the call and she'd been trying to get me and she was just all, I need you here now, you know, and I'm like, oh boy. So immediately, here, here's an event. I had a choice, all right? I can start imagining and picturing in my mind, you know, scenes of blood on the highway, you know, squirting out of people and stuff, and, you know, or I can go to the Lord and say, whatever is happening and whatever you've allowed, this is, this is what's supposed to be, and I'm with you. So it, it was great comfort to me to be able to align myself with God as I'm coming and approaching and I see, the, I see the wreck and I'm like, wow. And then I see Rhonda over there sitting up, two ladies around her helping her, these angels that appeared uh, that helped her and, and just stayed with her till the, till the ambulance got us. Uh, and so what a relief. But point being, I had a choice. Am I going to, am I going to, react and go into bitterness or am I going to surrender to God and go into love? Because those are two paths. See, see, one choice in your life starts a path. And if you stay on that path, rejecting God's plan and rejecting what God has allowed in your life will take you into bitterness. You'll become a bitter person. You'll be angry inside. You know anybody that's angry? They're just, I don't mean hangry, you know, because they're hungry. You know, I mean angry as a general rule. They have an angry disposition. This is a person that at some point God allowed an adverse event, something that hurt them, or they, they went through a loss, a great loss in their life, and rather than give it to the Lord, go through a grieving process where they ultimately accept it and give it to the Lord as something right and good. They continue to believe that this should never have happened. That God's will does not apply to my life. I should get everything that I want. And this loss that was in my life was, was against my human agenda. And it's not what I wanted to happen. It hurt me so bad and that justifies me being angry, maybe with God, maybe with just my life in general. And so I get irritated easily. I don't want to put up with people. I don't want to put up with God's agenda. So I'm angry. You know, I've been there in my life. And you might, you might, be, you, you might be well served to look within yourself and and ask yourself, how often do I get angry? You know, maybe I don't show it, but 
How often do I react within myself about the things that happened in my life rather than surrender them and be peaceful and let God have his way? So, let's talk about love. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about bitterness. And then we're going to talk about forgiveness. And so, love, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. We're going to learn that love can't count. Love does not keep score. I talked to the lady recently, and we were t- she, she was talking about love, Christian love, and I said, you know, Christian love does not keep score of the, the wrongs suffered. And so as we talked, she said, oh, that's right, I know, and I, I, I try not to do that. So as we continued to discuss her and her husband, which was the topic of our counseling session, you know, all along the way I could tell she said, like, he did this and he did that. And I said, oh, you're keeping score. You know, how many times did he do that? Well, he's done it three or four times a slat, you know. And I said, yeah, you're, you're adding it all up, aren't you? She said, oh. And I said, close your eyes. She closed her eyes. I said, you see all that? On, you see that on the board? Now erase the board. Erase the board. Get that out of there. And she did. And she's like, Phew. now the board's clean. I can start adding it up again. <laughs> it was getting kind of crowded in there anyway. First Corinthians thirteen five, talking about love. Love does not act. In, inappropriately, it does not seek its own. In other words, it's not selfish, is not provoked easily, and does not take account a wrong, take into account a wrong suffered. And the word to take into account is the word legizomai. It's a present middle indicative, and it means to keep score. In this context, it means to add things up to to credit something to an account, and it means to keep score. So in your relationships, do you keep score? Do you know how many times your husband or your wife has done something that irritates you or hurts you or you feel slighted? I mean, do you, do you remember those times? Here's a question. When, when you get hurt in a relationship, or maybe it's some simple thing, some simple thing. You know, maybe, maybe you're trying to talk and somebody interrupts you. And maybe they do it more than once and, and they, they, inter- they won't let you get your, they think they're smarter and know more than you. And so they, they interrupt you. And it's not like they hate your guts or, you know, they've attacked you. But that's... That's rude. That's, and so you feel slighted. You feel like this person thinks you're less important. Now, where are you going to go with that? Where are you going to go with that? I mean, you can go over here and say, you know, this guy, this girl must die, you know, or whatever. They, you know, must pay. I must find a way to punish them or whatever. And that's quite often what we do. We punish each other. When we get hurt and angry with each other, we sort of withdraw and think of ways that we can hurt each other and make each other pay. But love, listen, and those things happen, and we interrupt each other, and we say things in the wrong way. We emphasize things that don't really count or matter, and we hurt each other, and we slight each other. And this is all part of relating and learning how to relate to each other where we only edify. See, here's what Christians must learn. That you're required to only edify. You're not allowed in the plan of God to be selfish and relate in the way that you feel like you want to relate. You've, that's, that's, that's no longer. Now, 
that's a lot of teaching to understand that, really. But our job is to edify. So, love doesn't keep score. Love only edifies. Now, keeping score means to count, to add up, to calculate, to keep in the count, uh, to think, to reason, to consider, or conclude. But it means to keep score. It's a mathematical accounting of specific, specific events that occur in a relationship. I mean, some people that are listening to me right now have a pretty good score record of wrongs suffered in their marriage or in their relationship with parents or children. We just, we've added it up, and we see it clearly and it's the basis of how we relate to that person. We operate from that standpoint. Here they come again. I wonder, I wonder what's, what they want this time. <laughs> I got a friend, he says, every time I talk to my sister, I lose money. I know when she calls on the phone that I, that I might as well get my wallet out. I lose money. So... <laughs> You know, that's his, that's his view of her. That's a really loving relationship. Uh, but look, that's wrong on both, you know, the only time this person calls when they need something. When they want something, want you to do something. I'm like, well, you know, are y'all buddies? No, we're not buddies. Well, what do you want from her? You mean you call and look, you want her to call the day before that she needs something and just chat for a while. Follow me? And then the next day she can call and ask for something. Silly, silly stuff. The word wrongs, it does not keep score of the wrongs. The word wrongs is kakos, and it means wrong, evil, bad, something bad or foul. And it's the injuries that we suffer from relating. Listen, you can't relate. If you don't want to be hurt, then go live as a hermit. If you're going to be around people and you're going to and you're going to relate to people and let them into your life in, in any to any degree, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be disappointed. You might even be betrayed, or at least feel betrayed. You're going to feel put down, whether it is true or not. So many things that happen because all of us have a sin nature. All of us have an old man belief system that serves only me. It's our viewpoint of life that connects with the world that says, I must be the dominant person and get what I want. That's what the old man beliefs do. Now, love refuses to count, and it refuses to add up this record and keep score. Uh, it doesn't keep account of failures from other people. Now, here's a question. Can you start doing that now? Can you change? If you're a person who's been keeping score, and let me say this to you, if you're not a mature believer who has reached a point in your life where you realized you needed to stop keeping score, then you're a person who is still keeping score. It is natural, sin natural, for us to keep score. You say, well, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, you've just got a general score. Kind of a general score. You don't know the exact, exact number, but you know generally where you stand with this person. Wrongs, wrongs endured. Wrongs endured. Now, you can't forgive and keep score. And if you don't forgive, you can't grow in a relationship. When you, when you start keeping score, the very moment you start put a, you put it on the board, the very moment you write one, the relationship stops right there. Boom. That's it. Can't grow any farther. Now, if you write one and say, this is something that I need to work out in this relationship, that's a different matter. But if you say, this is something I'm going to hold against this person, 
That's not forgiveness. So many people say, yeah, I have forgiven. All you have to do is say, close your eyes. Remember the last time that y'all got into a big fight? Okay, I remember that. Now, how do you feel about that now? I'm still angry about it. Of course you are. Of course you are. You never let it go. See, that's the old man stuff. The reason why it's important is it, it, it fills us up with, with mental attitude sins. All this wrong thinking about how to live your life fills you up with mental attitude sins, and you can't function as a Christian with mental attitude sins dominant in your soul. I'm not talking about every now and then. I'm talking about being, being controlled by a false view of life. We have to remove that from our soul and replace it with, with the way, listen, the belief system of Jesus Christ. So, love refuses to keep score. So, if you will indulge me, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes for a minute. Now, I want you to think of someone with whom you're most intimate, that you care for the most in your life, the person that is the most dear to you. And I want you to look at the board, and I want you to, I want you to tell, tell yourself, and, you know, you and Jesus are standing here looking at this board. Your score. What you got on there for this person? What you got on there? What well, Jesus is saying, listen, you need to go erase that. Erase the board. Free yourself from scorekeeping. You're not the scorekeeper. You can open your eyes now. Yeah. Don't, don't close your eyes too long, you'll go to sleep. Love patiently accepts character flaws that cause on, ongoing sin offenses. Listen. Something that's very important to understand is that, is that love not only deals and, and forgives specific events, but it goes beyond that and looks into the person's character in areas of, of their character and their soul that are not yet fully developed, where they still need to grow. And in those areas, they're going to cause problems. Wherever you are holding on to old man baggage in relationships, that causes problems. That causes problems. Um, in a, uh, I know of a situation where uh, this one person is telling me that I get a call from this friend of mine, quote, friend, and as soon as I pick up the phone, this friend begins to tell me about their day and just goes and recites, every, I got up and I ate breakfast and I, you know, put on, and it's like I picked out this shirt and it's like, and, and this person is like, it's driving me nuts. It's driving me nuts. Well, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a person who is deeply insecure that needs to feel reassured and is trying to is seeking out reassurance by finding someone who will listen and pay respect to what's in their heart. And what this person needs is to grow spiritually. Grow spiritually. Well, what do I do with that? Change your number? I mean, I'm not sure. You know, it just depends on what the Lord is telling you. If the Lord is telling you to minister to this person, then I would say that you endure this, all the while courageously confronting the behavior and explaining what's, you know, something's behind that. What is it you're thinking and feeling? What are you saying to yourself when you call and say, I've got to recite all this stuff? so that you can help that person understand their own motives, take them to the Lord, and change, and grow. Help them grow. Character flaws are, cause us to know that this person in whom we have a relationship will likely sin against you 
again in the same way. You know that, right? It just keeps on happening, keeps on happening, and it's not that you need to get rid of them, and it's not that they're an evil person or that they hate your guts or they're trying to make you suffer. They need to grow. It's an area of life where they need to grow. And listen, all of us have got that. All of us need to grow. Now, when these events in your life occur, and instead of going against God and against the person into selfishness, when you give yourself to God, here's an event, and this potentially could hurt you. At a certain point of maturity, you, 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 you stop that from hurting you in the first place. You don't ever get to the place where you have to forgive because you don't get to the place where you've been wronged. You're just dealing with somebody who needs to grow. So it never gets in you to hurt you. But when you're intimate with someone who has areas of growth that need to be character flaws, that need to be corrected through growth, and you're dealing with them day after day, and you're intimate and open with them, they're going to sting you. Listen, they can't help it. They don't do it on purpose. They don't wake up in the morning and say, hmm, I wonder how I can get her this morning. I'm going to get her today. They're doing their best to love and give, and yet this is an area of growth, and it's gonna, you're going to get stung because you, <laughs> you had the great wisdom to end up in a relationship with this person. If you're married to them, hello. You know, uh, advice for those seeking a partner. Look for someone who doesn't have tons and tons of unresolved baggage. Unresolved baggage. They bring that stuff into the marriage and every bit of it, look, every, all that baggage gets brought out and laid on the bed and opened up. And these nice things get pulled out. How do you like this one? Yeah. Here's a good here's a good dose of I'm not going to talk to you for a week, you know how you like that one? I'm going to withdraw because you said so and so. That's marriage with baggage. And the goal, see, people come in and talk, and I say, well, you know, if you could get rid of all, oh, that would be nice if we could get rid of all that stuff. Well, look, you can't get rid of it unless you're going to be spiritual. Listen, nothing in the Christian life that we've been commanded to do and commanded to be functions as God intends without you being spiritual. That means in a growing relationship with God. Growing, growing, growing. Not, I know God's there. Hey, nice to see you. I'm on my way. I'm talking, all right, I'm moving towards you. I'm moving towards you, and everything in my life feeds this moving towards you. Everything in my life that comes along, good, bad, or indifferent, is all about, all allowed by God. Every bit of it runs across his desk, and he checks it off into your life to feed this growth process called transformation. Every bit of it, so that you can be intimate with God. Listen, this is bottom line Christian life. Bottom line. Now, let's look at the other side of this. When we don't give in to God and we don't see this event, this hurtful event, or these character flaws as something God has allowed for, our, for good. So, Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives and do not be made bitter toward them. The word bitter, picria or picrino, means something is sharp. It means to sharpen, sharp. It means anger, resentment, harshness, uh, exasperation. There's a lot of irritation, indignancy, to be grieved, consistently increasing resentment that builds up over time, 
based on adding up the flaws and failures of the other person. Adding up takes you to bitterness. If you've added up in your mind, if you've got a score with someone, then you're right on the edge or you're already in bitterness toward that person. And listen, once you get bitter, you can't be spiritual. You cannot be bitter and spiritual at the same time. Now, if you you got to get rid of bitterness. You got to come out of bitterness. And the way you do that is forgiveness. And we'll get to that in a minute. To get back over here in the growing side of things. Now, note: love and bitterness are opposites. That's what this passage teaches. You're supposed to love your wife, not be bitter. Now, what's interesting? In this passage is this word picrino is a present passive imperative. It is a command, but it's a, it's a present imperative, which means it's a standing command. This is every day, every moment, every day, that, every time you wake up, boom, this thing takes over. You're in it. But it's a passive voice. You know what the passive voice says? It says that you are experiencing something that's evoking a response. This is not just something out of the blue. This is an ongoing relationship with your wife, and her behavior is evoking bitterness from you. Passive voice says that whatever's happening out here is affecting you in here, and you're coming back with it. So, the wife has flaws, shortcomings, failures. Just every, every wife in the world has, that's ever lived and ever will has flaws and shortcomings. Now, whether they're willing to admit that or not is another question, but I'll leave that to the peanut gallery to answer that one. But uh, he is keeping score of everything that she does that he doesn't like. He's adding it all up, building a case. Listen, what, you know what we do when we add it up? We build a case. We build a case to bring against this person to change them. You've got to change. You've got to change. Now, those of you who've been married a while, have you ever tried that? You ever tried to get your mate to change? How's it working for you? People change when they come to the Lord and they decide to grow. It's got, it comes from within them. Nothing on the outside of another person can cause them to grow. You can't manipulate somebody into growth. Now what you can do is, is browbeat them enough where they stop doing certain behaviors. And if that's all you're interested in, go for it. But that's not, that's not Christian marriage. Listen, there's a lot of marriages that Christians involve themselves in that are not Christian marriages. There's a lot of Christian marriages where the women are in control, and, and that's, not, that's not what God is after. You say, well, it works for us. Yeah, I know it works for you. And the whole thing is talking about this bitterness side is it's all about works for me. Works for me? Well, it's not working for God, though. It's not working for God. Talking about uh, people that live together before marriage. I've uh, run to that recently, trying to explain to the people that, that all of this behavior is going gonna, is gonna to diminish the relationship even if you do get married. The, even, the worldly statistics, the divorce rate in America is about 50%. The divorce rate of people who live together before marriage is 75%. It just, it just diminishes. See, intimacy must, be, must live and function on the foundation of commitment. Before you can really be yourself, you have to feel confident that you're not going to be abandoned. And you're not going to be rejected. You're not going to be diminished and, and put down and criticized. 
It's hard to be yourself if you're not secure. It's hard to be open. So it creates all these patterns in your relationship with this person of intimacy without commitment. So you begin to relate from a standpoint of insecurity messes everything up. So you one day you get married and you think, okay, now that now we've got it, that fixes it. No, you bring all of those bad patterns you develop into your relationship. And if you ever, you, you may not ever get it right. You may not ever get it to a place where it's, where it's peaceful and functional. It's hard to get, listen, it's, it, marriage is hard to get to that place. It takes years and years of compromise and working together and communicating honestly with each other to get to a place where things can be peaceful and you can work together. That doesn't just happen. Now, there is such a thing as compatibility where two people are very much alike, and that's helpful as far as getting along. But as far as achieving a Christian marriage where the man represents Christ and the woman represents the church, and they're both spiritually minded, and that's their focus and their purpose for the way they conduct themselves. I'm going to be a picture of Christ to my wife, and she's going to be a picture of, of the church to her husband. That's Christian marriage. As long as your marriage is about me, 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 you don't have a Christian marriage. Now you, you can grow into one, but it's not about you. It is at a very base human level about your needs. But look, there's a point where you should be growing beyond that, where your service to the Lord is that you conduct your marriage for his sake. For his sake. My prayer for my marriage is that I will be able to love my wife for, because I love the Lord. And that she will be able to respond to me because she loves the Lord. I don't want it to be me. I don't want it to be because of me. So, bitterness responds to the other person's flaws and failures by rejecting them as something God has allowed in your life, resenting them, becoming angry, and ultimately becoming bitter because you can't resolve it. You tell yourself over and over, I can't live with that. Now, there are things you can't live with. You know, if, if the relationship is harmful to you, if somebody's beating you up, you know, or cheating on you, or lots of other things, you know, at some point you, you do, there are reasons to end relationships. But we're talking about, we're not talking about ending them, we're talking about growing in them. Using them to grow. Making them better. Making them more intimate. Making them more peaceful. Making them more effective. Functional. Growing. Growing. See, if you're not growing, then you're over here in the bitterness place. You are. You've stopped growing together. So, James 3.14, but since you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. Here's a person, he says, if, or since, and it says if and it's true, you do have bitter jealousy. And you do have selfish ambition in your relationships. You're bitter against this person. Jealous against this person. In verse 13, which is a comparison, he says, he compares it to the wise and understanding person who does good deeds with, a, with humble wisdom. He says, stop boasting and lying contrary to the truth. Competitive boasting and falsehood intended to discredit and destroy your competition. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like... Thanksgiving dinner with the family where everybody vies to be the number one. 
our family, we joke about who's the favorite or, or, or Rhonda's girls do, but, you know, they're all, and it's just fun. It's fun to watch that. And uh, the bushes, that's an inside joke, the bushes. I think your bush is, is ahead. So, hear that, D? <laughs> just playing. <laughs> all right, Hebrews twelve fifteen talks about a root of bitterness. If you study chapter 12, it's a, it's, a, it's a passage on discipline from the Lord. And listen, when you say discipline, we always think of spanking, but it's much more than that. It's a training program. It's a full-blown training program that uses the carrot and the stick. He uses everything in your life to move you toward him to break the hold of the world on your life, to break the hold of your selfishness. Me, me, me. Nothing in the spiritual life is more freeing and more wonderful than being able to cut the strings of me, me, me. So you can give. You can give, so you can think about others. You're standing in a group of people, your family or your loved ones, and all you're thinking about is me, 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 instead of noticing the other, how so-and-so feels today. I wonder what's going on with him. He doesn't look right. I mean, he, doesn't, he looks like something's being focused on other people. Wondering what's going on with them. So maybe you can edify them and encourage them or help them or do something. You're focused outwardly on other people instead of just me. I spent my whole life just about me. Starting to get to a place in my life because of the Lord, because of growth, where it's not so much that way. It's really nice. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, these people were under great, great adversity, under great persecution. They were losing their homes, their children, even their lives under the Jewish persecution of the church, first century. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, guys, hang in there. God knows what's happening. He knows what you're suffering. Hang in there. He is using this for your growth, but... Some, rather than seeing it as an opportunity to grow, the adversity. This is a great passage. In Hebrews 12, it teaches us that God is allowing so many adversities in our life for our growth. That's what, it, that's what they're for. But if you don't go that way, if you don't take that position and see it that way and go with God that way, you're going to go with your own self and you're going to move into bitterness because God won't let your life be what you want it to be. He won't let it. You, you're, you're cranking out your human agenda as hard as you can go, listening to all these positive thinking stuff, thinking I'm going to make it work, I'm going to make it work, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be great. And God puts blocks in front of you every step you take. And you're like, what is the deal? I went, <laughs> came home from Arkansas, went to school and got a master's degree thinking, you know, see, I'd always worked out in the weather and been in construction and had to do difficult things and jobs I didn't like. So I thought, you know, along with getting the spiritual things that I was needing for my growth, I thought, well, I'm going to get a level of education where I'll always be able to get a job. Good job with benefits to take care of my family. Hello, 250 resumes later, not even a phone call. You think that's not something, you don't think that's a roadblock in a man's ambitions? Absolutely. For It took me several years to understand what God was doing. I'm a little slow. A lot slow, actually, but... It, but once I begin to realize that I'm not under discipline, you know, I, I'm not in the wrong place, that God is using this for my growth. 
And so I clicked into a different mode of using it for growth, and it's like, boom. Now I realize great blessing, wonderful blessing. I wouldn't have wanted that job. The job I've got now of walking with God and, and giving to whoever comes, who could ask for anything better than that? He just sends what we need day to day, day to day. Sends it day to day. And let's talk real quickly about forgiveness. Love refuses to count or add up the wrongs suffered, but bitterness is a mathematician. Bitterness is, is an expert at keeping score. Now, forgiveness. The word forgiveness, afiemi, means to release someone from a debt. To cancel a monetary debt owed to a creditor. Somebody comes and pays off your mortgage and frees you from that debt. In a relationship, it talks about somebody who's wronged you, and in your mind, they owe you. They owe you an apology. They owe you an I'm sorry. They owe you a recognition that they harmed you. Now, let me say this. In the spiritual life, those are all inappropriate and unnecessary. In intimate Philos friendship relationships, there is such a thing as equity, balance. If you have a relationship and it's a friendship that's voluntary on both sides, the only reason you round that person with that is because you like them and enjoy them. And they do something to hurt you or harm you. If they don't know it, you need to tell them so that the relationship can get back on an even keel. Because if they've harmed you and hurt you on a friendship basis, that is a, a, that is a legitimate question of whether you want to continue. See, you don't have to be friends. The friendship is a, is a personal choice. You don't have to be friends with anybody. I remember growing up in the Baptist church where they thought love meant you had to be friends with everybody. Had to love everybody, so you had to be really sweet and nice to everybody. Well, I, you know, and you go to church in the morning, and I'm the last thing I am in the morning is a morning person. So I would go to church like, yeah, yeah right, hello. And they're like, you're not very spiritual, are you? I'm like, no, I guess not. But anyway, point being, freeing people from their debt. Jesus talks in Matthew 18 about the parable of the unmerciful servant. The master forgave his debt, canceled his monetary debt, instead of selling him into slavery. He canceled it. Now the man owed him. See, at this point in history, if you owed more than you had, then you had to be indentured. You become a servant to that person until you pay it off. And they add up your wages and when you get it paid off, you're a free man again. It's not a slavery exactly, it's indentured. You know, you owe, you owe. They could do it with your kids. It was a terrible thing. 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, talks about the man disciplined by the church. He was into inappropriate sexual behavior. Oh, Paul says, forgive him. Because they had ostracized him to discipline him. You know, listen, the guy, the guy was sleeping with his stepmother, from what it appears, and coming into the church and bragging about it. And the other people, the, the other guys in the church were like, wow, you got to come to our church. We got a guy that's sleeping with his stepmother. You know, you're talk, talking about sinners. We got the sinners. So that's where Paul said, this is, this is crazy. This has got a hand. This guy needs to be removed. And the influence he's having on the rest of the church needs to be abated. Well, they sent the guy out and separated from him, and he repented. And he wanted back in, and they're like, no, 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 you're a sinner. You know, you're tainted permanently. And Paul said, what are you talking about? Everybody gets a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a 20th chance, a 100th chance. Everybody gets another chance with God every time. So 
1 John 1, 9, we get released from the dead. 1 John 2, 12, our sins are judicially forgiven permanently. Ro love refuses to add all this up when, when we're wrong. It erases the record of sins. Love erases the board. Every single day when you get up, love erases the board and you start all over. Forgiveness diligently applied avoids the buildup and the adding up of bitterness. Okay? If you apply love diligently, awareness, listen. Listen, guys. Listen, everybody listen to me right quick. You got to wake up. You got to get, get out of autopilot where you just zip through your day. You zone through your day. You're unaware of the spiritual life around you and you're just doing your thing. You got to wake up and take stock of what's going on around you and realize that you're in the middle of a spiritual war and you're one of the warriors. And you're just stumbling through your life like nothing was happening. Let's wake up and be aware and alert to what's going on around us. God is right there. Intimate relationships are initially built on personal preference called conditional love. Conditional love, which is where you like somebody or enjoy somebody. It, the, your love has a condition, i.e., I have to enjoy you or I don't want to be around you. Conditional love is not sufficiently powerful to maintain an intimate relationship because there's always going to be problems. Somebody's going to hurt the other. Somebody's going to... Not pay, they're going to be gone and not call, and they're not going to realize that you're waiting. This. All kinds of things. You know what I'm talking about. Relationships are allowed to continue growing through the use of Christian virtue, i.e. forgiveness, love. Everyone wrongs and is wronged in an ongoing relationship. It's just the way it works. There are no perfect people, and nobody's going to do it right every time. Wrongs suffered must be absorbed and given to the Lord. Then the board must be erased where you start over. Our natural tendency is to add our wrongs up and build up anger, building a case against the person to justify my anger. And listen, you can make your case and the other part, the, the guy, well, no wonder you're angry. No wonder you're angry at this guy or this girl. Look at the way they're behaving. Absolutely. And you're like, you're right. I needed somebody to, to, to be on my side to justify my anger because I need this person to change. Well, that's the human, sinful, bitter approach to life. It's not the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life says, the wrongs that I have suffered from this person, I absorb and give to the Lord and wipe it out and I start all over. I start all over. But listen, the, the trick, the key to this thing is erasing the board. Truly and fully erasing the board. Because we say, oh, I forgive you but we still got the score up here. Still, still got the score. We don't, let them, we don't let this person start over new with us. 1 John 1, 9, we start over brand new with God every time. He's not holding our... Listen, how far are the sins? From the east to the west. We got to go here. Okay. Finally, when sins add up, it intensifies resentment, builds a boundary line in the sand, and it destroys a relationship. Destroys it. Rather than growing, listen, the joy of a relationship is from the love that, that develops and the growth that comes. The heartache of relationship is bitterness and anger and destroying and, and hatred toward each other, which is where it goes. Two options. Galatians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let's pray and we'll take an offering.
guess we got the bucket somewhere. You got them? All right, let's pray. Father, what a great privilege it is to hear the Word of God, to be confronted with these basic and simple principles of love and bitterness and then the forgiveness that makes it all work. Father, we know that it is forgiveness that allows relationships to continue and to continue on in a positive uh, spiritual way. And I just pray that we would take this to heart and look at our own life and be willing to make the changes to our own heart and character. I pray, Father, for the money that's given this morning, that you will use it in a mighty way, that you will support ministries, and that, that those who receive the money will, will be honorable with it and that you will do great things with it. And we ask it in Christ's name. <clears throat> Amen.